Life Rhythms with Ryan Sky. Observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. Welcome to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Skye. Life Rhythms is a radio show that revolves around my personal growth journey. As a DJ and a producer, I spend a lot of my time observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. I've been doing it in song form, and now I do it on the radio show and podcast. Life Rhythms, each episode of Life Rhythms, we feature one guest and one song or album, and I choose topics related to the guests and their music for us to talk about on the episode. And I'm really excited for today because I have here in the studio with me Lady Camden. Hello, so happy to be here. From season 14 of RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm-hmm. Drag queen, ballet dancer, choreographer, singer, mm-hmm. what else, actor? Yeah. You took acting. Uh, act- what was that? Acting, choreography, ballet. You draw too, right? Yeah, I paint my face every day. Right? <laughs> We're featuring your single, Dirtiest Secrets. Yay. And we are going to talk about, so for those of you that are familiar with Lady Camden fans that I know are going to be watching this, Life Rhythms is not a type. Life Rhythms is a show where artists come to share their hearts and pull back the curtain on their music. We don't ask typical interview questions, so you're going to get to learn stuff about Lady Camden that she hasn't shared in other interviews. Right? Mm-hmm. We really try to like get to the core of like your humanity and your artistry, and yeah. try to have a, a, a nice moment. It's like a ch- cozy fireside chat. Yeah, the realness. Yeah. So we're going to cover your post what like post show experience. We're going to talk about relationships and how they kind of maybe shift and change how navigating new relationships is different after being on tv yeah a lot of people knowing who you are um good and bad i think you know it's complicated yeah so we dive into that and we dive into um self-confidence a lot too. Yeah. yeah yeah discovering it and accepting it yeah so we're gonna get into all of this we're gonna talk about the single dirty secrets uh-huh. right after this break on adobe radio This episode is brought to you by Mixillary.com. I'm excited to have Mixillary on as a sponsor personally because Mixillary is a platform that you can use to find and hire someone to remix your song. And why that's so important is because anybody can go online and you can search music producers, you can search for remixers, you can hire somebody. But it's like, how much do you pay them and who should you hire and what genre should you choose? And with option overload, it can be a little overwhelming to figure out what's the best use of your money. Because what it comes down to is remixes are marketing tools. A remix of a record will get that record in front of a larger audience. It will get that record played in venues and areas like the gym or a club or a you know, car or a fitness studio, places that maybe your original song may not be appropriate for. So it is an important marketing tool, but then who remixes it is important because first of all, the quality of the remix and also maybe they have their own audience that's going to discover this remix. Maybe they have a following. Maybe they have a radio show. Maybe they tour and they'll be playing it out live. These are all sorts of things that are important. So Mixillary is a service that that will help match you with the best remixer for your budget. So check out Mixillary.com for more information on this. I wanted to ask you before we start, I was going on your Wikipedia, mm-hmm. and one of the things that it highlighted was that during the, the filming of Drag Race, in between episodes, you watch porn in the... Oh my God. This is so ridiculous. Like, like I think the internet grabs onto things, and they're just like, oh. It's in the like, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is so strange. That is so, what it is, was like, we all get asked like interview questions, you know, press when the, when the cast is announced and, you know, I was just trying to give some like inside tea, you know, and, um, the girls made a joke about like when you're in quarantine and when you're filming, you know, you are, you don't have your phone, you don't have access to the internet. Uh, The whole point is to keep you sequestered so that it's a very fair competition. We don't get access to like outside information outside help from people it's really just like so i was warned about this so i said well i'm you know i'm human being i need to bring some porn <laughs> so i did and i'm not the first person to do it but i'm the first person to maybe talk about it in an interview I like that. and then it was like on wikipedia w- wikipedia also says like rex lives as an openly gay man at the end of it as well <laughs> it's just so funny i'm like 
You I don't see. fucking say Wikipedia. I saw that on there, and I wanted to ask you about it because I'm like, okay, if it's in what? Wikipedia, I'm like, did I miss something? Was is this it a big thing? Right? Was it's this not a, a big thing? Well, because also because your song is "Dirtiest Secrets," mm. right? It's it's got sexual connotations yeah. to it, and then also you debuted the song at Folsom, and then I so read like, that in Wikipedia. Well, I'm wondering. <laughs> I'm wondering. I'm like, is this is this Lady Camden's thing? Yeah. That I've wanted to ask you about it. I don't. I think maybe people are surprised that I'm like you know, sexual and, and horny or whatever because I'm a lady and like my drag is very theatrical and it's very theater, stage, camp. It's not mm. necessarily like, um, it's not necessarily upfront that I'm like sexual. Yeah. And I, I think, I'm, I don't know, I'm an adult, I'm a human and I, I think I'm just not afraid to talk about it. And in this song, especially, I was just like, it, it just surprised a lot of people and I, a lot of my fans are younger, sweet teenagers and mums. A lot of mums oh, that yeah. love how nice and sweet and <laughs> and soft I am, which I am. Yeah. But I'm also, you know, a funny. sexual <laughs> being. You're a human. <laughs> I'm human, exactly. Right. And I just, I just, I'm also maybe just at that age where I just don't really care to not talk about things. Yeah. You know, I just don't see the point in it. Oh, I love this. Yeah. We're doing a rolling start. Can we? Can yeah. we include all this? Of course. Okay. I do feel like this song was just unexpected for a lot of, even my friends. And I think, um, I don't know, I think maybe I'm late to the game in stepping into my sort of sexual era or whatever, or like openness to talk about it. And my human nature era is like just starting late. Um, Cause I, th I don't know, I just was like this ballet dancer for such a long time and came from a world where that I wanted to be perfect and wanted to be, you know, a a charming prince on stage and, and not conservative, but kind of tradition, traditional conservative, tra classic, yeah. classical and, yeah. and, classical and sweet. And, and that is who I am. But I think I stepped into an era later in life where I was like, Oh no, I, I need to be a bit more liberated than that now, you know? Um, and this is this kind of like your Britney Spears moment. A little bit. It's my blackout era. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Not quite. It's, I'm not, you know, shaving my head and st what is it still still a girl not yet a woman what is the song right. i'm not, not a girl i'm not, not a girl, yet a woman no, 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 no. she's like yeah. in between mm -hmm. that's cool so i don't know she was a lot younger when she made that <laughs> song than i am but um yeah i don't know i think i'm just i grew up listening to so much madonna and i think that the one thing that i think of when i think of madonna is a changing of eras like always mm. morphing and changing mm. and there is this pressure when you leave Drag Race or maybe any reality TV show that you've got to sell your brand and you've got to let people know who you are all the time. And the most successful drag queens do that very, very well. Yeah. RuPaul, Trixie, Jinx. Um, so I know that they're right, but something in me is just like, I like to change and, and adapt and morph a little bit. And maybe I just haven't found my penultimate, you know, stamp of who I am. Yeah, I'm still, I just like to change. Adobe listeners, I want to catch you up with us right now. Hi. This, this is Life Rhythms, radio show and podcast, and I'm in the studio right now with Lady Camden. Lady Camden's a drag queen on RuPaul's Drag Race, or you, mm -hmm. you competed on RuPaul's Drag Race season 14. Yes. Runner-up. Yes. Tour the world. Yeah. You have a new single out called Dirtiest Secrets. Yes. Which we're playing clips of throughout the show. Yay, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> so it's so fun to have you on here, and I really, like, I want to start off with the Adobe is a I, the Adobe audience pretty diverse, but a lot of the audience is the pop punk, the alternative rock, and then on social media we have a lot of the LGBTQIA plus mm -hmm. um, audience. And but the the punk aspect with you, I'm interested in kind of highlighting that right from the beginning, so the Adobe audience can can kind of see some points of where where you might have some interest. You grew up, Lady Camden, mm -hmm. Camden. You grew up in Camden mm -hmm. town. Camden Town. London. Yeah. yeah. Right? And Camden is... Camden is... Known for the punk scene. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely developed and gentrified over the years. When I was a kid, I think it was definitely an epicenter of music and punk. And, you know, a lot of the punk kids would, would go and hang out on the streets in Camden and hang out by the bridge and just rock a look and just show everybody how they look and... And just hang out, you yeah. know. And then they would obviously go out at night there too. But it was definitely just a place to go and be seen, and and wear crazy outfits, and and you know you could tell these kids had like were kind of running away from home in a, in a in a so to speak, you know. And and 
and being rebellious and piercing everything mm. that they possibly could all over their face, tattoos everywhere. Yeah. And I was, you know, around what, 10 or something. And so I found it just fascinating and interesting and a, lo- a little intimidating and scary. My dad used to run a nightclub. Electric. The Electric Ballroom. ballroom yeah, yeah. Which maybe is where music still is like important to me because of that. It's, I just was around a lot of it and around a lot of, you know, they would do concerts throughout the week, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday night would be like their club nights. And, um, and your sister DJed? My sister DJed for a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I would make friends with the DJs, obviously ask them to play Britney Spears and Aqua, and they would, obviously wouldn't. <laughs> that's not what they <laughs> Aqua, but now Aqua's had her, had a moment I with know, Barbie I Girl. Love it. I was so happy. Yeah, I was like, I've been playing remixes of Barbie Girl mm-hmm. for years, yeah. and when you and up until recently, people would not know really know what it was. Well, but I, now I, obviously, I, don't know. I think it's such a classic staple. Maybe it in the is. drag world, it is. Yeah, there's, there's a drag queen playing it at every moment in somewhere on the world on the planet mm. right now. Someone. Some drag queen is lip syncing to Barbie Girl, yeah. um, you know. But I, I love it. It's, it's so nostalgic to me that that Aqua is having a renaissance right now. Mm, I love it. Yeah. Um, and same with like, I always joke to my to Bosco, one of the other girls on my season, who's my one of my best friends. Um, I always, I always remind her that the Venga Boys are still touring and performing to this day. They're hits mm, constantly. Mm. They're just touring the world. I can't believe it. It's been so long, and they're just. Singing the same old songs and the audiences are living for it. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's wild. I have some notes here on Camden for those that are still n- new to the idea of Camden. It's the fundamental place of London's punk scene. And f- from what I understand, in 1966, Pink Floyd debuted at the Roundhouse. And that was London's first ever all-night raves. And this set the stage for iconic and legendary artists that came from that. There's a bit of like... um I think it's a bit controversial of like where punk originated from. Mm -hmm. Some say London, some say New York, but at least in London, you had Pink Floyd debuting at Roundhouse in 1966. And then as you had said, um, it was like an ex-industrial part of London, right? And then it was an unpoliced area. People felt free to spend their time and and dress up. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, I just felt like a bit of a... a rebellious scene. It wasn't... You weren't there to sort of fit in. You know, you were yeah. there to sort of experience what it was like to stick out or want to stick out and yeah. just a bit of an F you to everything else, you know. Um, I think, you know, when I named myself Lady Camden, I was aware that like a lot of people are gonna be like, Well, how do you represent Camden? Mm. You know, you you don't I don't scream Camden Town when I'm s- sat here with feathers and sequins, you know, that's definitely not Camden yeah. Town. But I sort of knew personally it's not about telling people that I represent cities like this where I'm from and that's what made me who I am and I love it and I literally just get happy thoughts when I think of Camden so I think that yeah. if you're going to say something every day you should say something that sparks joy yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. it kind of reminds me of the the club kids scene in New York like in the early 2000s yeah. like in terms of kids running away from home and dressing up to stand out and kind of yeah. rebel and it's right, a, you know none of those kids were born in Camden necessarily they probably went there from other places and just to feel like they were part of a tribe. Yeah. So you went there, was that, that was your first time kind of exploring yourself? You said you felt like a little intimidated by I people? mean, I grew up near it, so I would have to go there anyway because my dad would be working until five or six and I was done with school at four. And so I would like hang out at the ballroom and just spend a lot of time by myself in the club, in the empty club. Mm. So I think my imagination would sometimes go a bit wild and I would like dance around the club and skate around and listen to music and, so it just that's a specific part of my childhood that I really, really cherish and I yeah. love it because I felt like I was surrounded by stuff going on. Like that like Camden was just it's exciting. Fun. And it was like, you know, all of my parents' friends were cool and they, you know, they would drink and smoke and party and and they were just cool. And I wanted to yeah. be like them and like one of their friends. And um it's one of those areas that if I could go back in time for like a minute, I would go there. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Would you do anything differently, or would you just no, indulge just in it? In more, I would just. Yeah, I don't know. Like, my parents would get their friends to babysit me sometimes too, and they were cool and wild. How, and... how old were you? Like, what what part of your life is this? I mean, it's throughout my childhood, but I was this saying, like teens. No, teens. I was already at boarding school. Okay, doing ballet. so this is like adolescent. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So it was like that age where you see people partying and doing 
you know, drugs and drinking and, and you're sort of like so fascinated by it, but you're way too young to experience it. Ah, but, you know, but you're like, oh, this is out is there. Yeah. yeah. And then you're like, I want to find my own version of this. Right. And then it was funny, the first time I actually went to the electric ballroom as an adult to a club night, I was like, oh, this is way too straight for me. I can't. Was it? <laughs> well, what was it like? What was the I vibe? I just was used to going to gay clubs. You yeah. Know? And uh, it's just a different vibe. How, how are the people? Because I, when I was in college, I bartended at a, a like the straight club in Pittsburgh. Uh-huh. And that was my first. It, I just did a lot of people watching. Yeah. Like I was a bartender, but I just would watch the girls like, you know, getting free drinks from the guys. Mm-hmm. I'd watch the dudes kind of present themselves. Right. Like, right and right. not dance too much at the music right. and, and just all the little stories that went on. I mean, I won't lie that like there is a similar kind of, you know, uh, energy in a gay club where, you know, people are trying to look cute. They're trying to hook up. They're trying to meet their match as well. Yeah, it's not like gay yeah. people are not trying to do the same thing. It's right. just, it's diff- it's just, I think it's different when you feel queer and you don't feel like you are one of those cute girls getting a free drink or one of those macho guys trying to be cool. Like when you don't fit into either category, you feel a bit lost. Mm. And I think with a gay club or a queer space, um, the hope and the goal is that you don't have to fit into one of two categories. You can fit into whatever category you want. That's the goal. I mean, I say that, but then of course there are certain clubs where, you know, you've got to look a certain way. Like there's clubs here in, in LA that are very like, if you're not hot and muscly and, you know, if you don't look like everybody else there, then you don't feel, f- you know, there's the same sort of thing going on in gay clubs too. It's just, um, I would say maybe less of it. Or there's more opportunity to be an outsider in a queer space than yeah. there is in a, a heteronormative club, in my experience. Yeah. I can't speak for every club, obviously, but that's just been my experience. It might, what's it like to, you, you've you experienced being in the gay, gay culture, gay clubs as Rex, mm-hmm. pre-drag queen, pre-drag race. Mm-hmm. But now you walk in and you kind of like unlock like drag queens, especially when you've been on drag when you've been on RuPaul's Drag Race. It's kind of like it unlocks a social door for you. And yeah. now when you go, I'm, I'm, I imagine people treat you differently, right? They light up when they see you, or what it is, is it? It's weird. You've experienced both sides. <laughs> it's really weird. And you're like, I'm the same person, but now you're yeah. all treating me differently. It's really weird to even think that like there's people listening to this that that I like there are some fans of mine probably tuning into this because I'll post it on my Yeah. And even that is still a weird concept to get my head around because I just don't I feel like it's just me and I'm just whatever. And I started doing drag, like most drag queens say jokingly for drink tickets, right? But I <laughs> like oh, for free drinks, which is I still get free drinks <laughs> in my home bar. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um but I think I did it more because I was lonely. And this sounds really sad and pathetic, but it's true. Um, when I first moved to San Francisco, I was I joined to I moved to join a ballet company, a contemporary dance company. And when you join Sacramento, uh, before, or is this before Sacramento? It was after Sacramento. Sacramento was for five years, and then I moved to San Francisco mm. and joined a dance company called Smuin. And with any mm. dance company or probably any workspace that you join, you move somewhere for. It's a bit insular at first. Mm-hmm. You make the friends that you work with. It's hard to make friends in a big city as an adult. Um, you know. It's easier to make money than it is to make friends. Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah. And San Francisco is impossible to make money. So like, it's even <laughs> so more. You're, fucked you're really ways. fucked. <laughs> but, you know, I had a feeling. I was like, I think I just need to find a tribe, a little corner of the city. And then I'll, I think I'll get there. And so I actually got like really injured one year and I spent a lot of time by myself and that's when I started painting my face just to make myself feel cute. It was that childhood thing, drawing, painting, right? Yeah. Um, and then I started to go out to the clubs because I started to think, okay, I'm pretty cute. I can, I'm presentable enough to yeah. go out. Yeah. And then I kind of started to like the attention I was getting from people. Just like, hey sis, like, like people would just come up to you and give you a compliment or, or just feel like they could talk to you. Like something about being in drag, at least in my experience, is inviting people to you to just talk to you to engage with you and so because i was alone and i didn't have friends i was like yeah it's great i'm making so many friends really rapidly and really fast and um because i could dance it was a it was an advantage that like if i didn't have my drag completely together i would still get opportunities to perform and opportunities to be out and about and i really just was drawn to it because i was making friends and i made so many queer friends and now I'm like, it's different now. Now I really cherish less friends. Like I, mm. my circle, my inner circle is smaller. 
and then there's like a parameter circle of friends that I love mm. but you there's there's like six that I have to hold really close and they know everything about me and there's people that I have to be a little bit more boundary-ish with yeah which I never used to have to do that you know yeah did you learn the hard way this or did you have people mentoring you previous queens telling you like hey I think this is what you're it. gonna you start to feel it you like, can kind of see people's intentions you do like you know you know when yeah, people are your yeah. friends for a reason and when, when people are your friends because they just love you and you give something to them too whereas when it's a one-way street you know you feel it and i even like dated someone that i feel like at the end of it i was like oh i think you were just in love with like the excitement of dating someone that you've seen on tv and that you like on tv yeah and that's hard that's really hard because that's when you get vulnerable and open to someone and you get upset or burnt when you feel like they just dated you because of who you yeah. are and you don't want to admit it because you're like well maybe they're different i'm sure it's not that and they you just it's hard you have to be protective of yourself and you have to be like smart do you wish you could date somebody i don't know what your dating status is right now but do you wish you could date somebody that didn't know anything about you yes yeah i do it's like a, it's like someone who's rich dating and not wanting the person to know they're wealthy or know they're famous yeah. or know they're the thing with me is not like i'm so famous that people are trying to buy their way into a better lifestyle like i'm not like mariah carey where if you date me you're going to be set yeah you know it's like i'm famous in certain specific circles people right. that watch this specific show and they don't know that I'm rich or poor, so I don't think people yeah. would date me for that reason. So that's yeah. nice. It's yeah. not so famous that it's like yeah. crazy. But it's famous enough that if I'm dating someone, I'm going to be dating someone within our circles and, and within our social circles, people watch my show. So it's just like, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. But, you know, there's a nice balance of people that watch it, appreciate it, respect it, whatever, but are not obsessed with it. And yeah, that's, yeah. That's the sweet spot, you know. I want to ask you because right now I have this ongoing dialogue with myself in my life right now about dating, about like really trying to decide and understand like who am I wanting to be with? Who, because part of me, part of me feels like I live my life um, kind of like we have kind of rare, like we approach, I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it into words, but it's like I feel like we are, we live our lives. There's only, we're a small percentage of the population that is living life the way we do. Mm -hmm. And so I don't meet a lot of other people like that. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, like, do I want to also date somebody who's right. living their life the way I am? Or I did so date somebody in the industry. And, and then I thought, well, maybe I want to date just like a regular good person with <laughs> values. Like they don't have to have all this stuff going on. Yeah. I don't have the answer to that. What and I you? asked the same thing and, and I wish I did. <laughs> if I did, I'd, I'd probably be better set. I, I think it's just case by case, honestly. I yeah. think it's like, you know there are certain people in your industry that you would love to date, but you know it would be a bit toxic and poisonous and weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know there are people that wouldn't. Like, I think it's just case by case. I think, you know, it's like, would I date another drag queen? I am I wouldn't date them because they're like yeah. in my industry. I think it would be nice to know that there's someone that has an appreciation for like when I'm fucking, t excuse me, when I'm tired or when I like can't do something or when my schedule is difficult. That is where I would have an, a love for like someone having compassion for that. Yeah. But I don't know. I think that as humans, we're attracted to something that's not reflected in who we are necessarily. Yeah. I yeah, think yeah, like yeah. I'm attracted to something different. Yeah. Um, But I don't know. I don't have like, so much experience with dating i think yeah. i've been so work focused for so many years that's why i've been trying to date again yeah because i think work has taken over my life that i'm like really craving some space as rex and dating so i've started to get back into dating started doing a lot of therapy about it, reading books actually about relationships oh i study relationships too you do yeah i read this book called us by terence taylor okay He's a therapist, like a couples counselor. Okay. And every issue that comes up in a in a relationship is like comes from something that you've been taught by your parents yes. or behavior that's been given to you. Like attachment theory. Mm -hmm, attachment, all that stuff. Yeah. And it's really interesting because he will address it and then he'll give you an example. Like he'll, he'll or he'll address like a certain kind of abuse or trauma or attachment style, or whatever yeah. the topic is, and then he'll go, take 
Michael and Daisy, for example, mm. he was 40, she was blah, blah, blah. Like, and then he goes through their story and it's so interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, what I got into this tangent, but I think um, it, it's a lot about like when you're in a relationship, treating it as us, not you and me. Yeah. And then when you're not in one, it's like, or even if you are, it's it's about like strengthening your adult self to be secure and safe and know that you'll be okay if you're alone or if you're disappointed, like you'll take care of yourself. I think that when you do that, you're attracting the right person. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because you're not mm -hmm. looking for someone to f fill any gap in you. Yeah. Pun intended. Um, <laughs> but unless you are trying to f <laughs> fill a couple gaps, that's fine too. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I, think, yeah. I think, I think, easier said than done. I'm not saying yeah, that yeah. I am completely, I figured out who I am and I'm, yeah, I'm not that. I'm, I'm a mess too. But like, I, is good to read this and go okay the more good i am with who i am the more i'm gonna attract the right person at the right time whether it's in the industry or not mm -hmm. you know i've noticed that to talk i mean that's life rhythms that's the show yeah yeah, yeah that's what i love about like, this when are you show. gonna talk about music talk about i love about <laughs> well this is the thing like for your for your fans that are watching right now like yeah. this is not a typical show we don't ask typical interview questions. Yeah, My goal is always for fans to get to know you more than they already do. Mm -hmm. They've seen you on the show. They've so, seen, yeah. you know, all the interviews. Um, yeah, it's true. I, I will say for sure what I know I do want in a, in a partner is I definitely, like when I see interviews of say like Barack Obama mm -hmm. and he's like, I would not be where I'm at if it wasn't for Michelle. Mm -hmm. Like I love when I see interviews of people who are successful and they have a partner that they somehow that partner supported them in a way that they were able to get further together. Yeah. That's like the core of what I want. I agree with that. I, and you see it in other examples too. You know, I think yeah. in drag, there's a lot of, a few of my friends in San Francisco, especially actually, um, are drag queens that have what we call a drag husband where someone that like goes to the shows with them, like helps mm -hmm. them with their suitcases, oh. maybe even does hair, maybe even helps with their outfits. And that's not something that you can expect to find easily. I think that's a very wow. like yeah. specific, you know, I would never put an expectation on a new date that I want them to be carrying my suitcases <laughs> and styling my fucking wigs. But like, I think, <laughs> in fact, in fact, anything, I'm someone that I love to have my sh my stuff separate. You know, like I like to take ownership agency of what I do and not feel like I need the other person. But I do think the Barack Obama Michelle thing is probably more to do with like emotional support than anything. Yeah. You know, she's probably just like his cheerleader and he's hers. And like, you know, so I think there's like you that know? you want someone that is just like genuinely proud of you and excited for your achievements who sees you and, and your is potential not competitive about it yeah not competitive that's something that i yeah. learned recently too yeah with um n not anyone specifically but you can feel when you're sharing something with someone and you can see when you share an achievement with them you can see what happens to their face when they are like oh my god that's exciting for us as friends that you got that achievement mm. Or, oh, well, what am, and then they go through their head, what am I achieving? What, what, where, where, does, where does this put me? That's a tricky thing. You know, I've you can see it that, yeah. in the people's faces when you're like, oh my God, I just got this crazy gig. I got paid way too much money for it. How sickening is that? And they're like, oh, like you, that's great. Yeah. And then they're going through their head, like where they have or haven't achieved things. Or friends that are like, bitch, work. You better fucking get that gig. Good yeah. Thing. You know? And I can feel the difference more, especially after Drag Race. Okay. The difference between a friend that is like, yes, bitch, you better get that crazy gig. And ones that are like, they feel it affecting them differently. Mm -hmm. you know? I've had friends and I've dated people where me, just the me in my life, it serves at a, as an uncomfortable mirror to them and is kind of like reminding them of what they're not doing with their exactly. lives. Exactly. But then I've had the opposite. I've dated people and I've had friends that are like what you're saying. They're just genuinely happy and supportive yeah. and doing their own thing. Yeah. And it's hard when you feel that with family. I didn't want to go there. But like mm. I felt that with family. Yeah. And this has, has been a big shift of like the ones that are just like so like proud, ride or die, and some that are like, you know, it's just, it happens, I think. It's human nature to feel sometimes micro-jealousies or competitiveness with people because it's really a reflection on, like, you not being happy with where you're at. I think that's what it is. Yeah. You know, like, I've only felt, like, those feelings to people when I'm 
not sure where I'm at, you know? Yeah. I'm so different from my family. Like, how are you? I just went home recently to visit them. And it just, every time I go home, it's like, I feel like I'm stepping back in time. Yeah. And I just cannot get over how different we are. I love them, but I have like, I struggle with the feeling of like, I know, I know I'm supposed, I want to feel closer to everyone. I want to love this, but like, we're all so, I'm just, I feel, I feel like a, I don't know. It's really hard. This transition from, from just being more available yeah. to not has really um, tested certain relationships. Mm. And I just, you know, there are people that if you pick up the phone right now, if I call them a text, then I'll get a response and it's not weird and it's fine. Yeah. Even if I haven't talked to them in three months. Yeah. And everyone has those friends. You know, I think we all have someone that we can think of the top of our head. Uh, that person, yeah, we're fine. Yeah. Um, and then there's some people that are just so resentful that you're not the same person anymore. And I think that's my experience. I don't know if that's you, but yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Always, you know, as queer people too, like, I feel it's different not to be like. That's the other thing too, is no one in my family is queer. Yeah. And so that's why that it's different. It's not that like we're better or worse or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Like, I don't want straight people to be like, oh, I'm so sick of these queer people saying that it's different. It's harder for us. It's, 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 what's different is that you, you literally grow up, um, Fight, like trying to earn acceptance of who you are fundamentally and straight people don't have to do that yeah you know just in terms of like straight and gay i'm not talking about anything else like yeah, yeah, yeah. i think it's that's what or queer i should say like i think that's what makes you as a person then continue to question your identity who you are you evolve you change your style you know yeah you change your careers more like you don't have this sort of um heteronormative expectation of where your life is going to go, like where I'm going to do this job and I'm going to get married and have kids and then live in a house and it's going to be gorgeous. As queer people, you're like, I don't really have a straight and narrow look at what it should look like. I don't even know. Like growing up, we didn't couldn't even get married. So That's what we I'm didn't saying. know like, for what, your, yeah. So then you grow up with this like questioning, I think. Yeah. And evolvingness and like not really willing to kind of fall as yeah. much. And again, it's a huge generalization. I'm not speaking about every single queer person. Some queer people love to just want to keep things, you know, yeah. simple and, and, and traditional. And I love that too. And I think, but I wonder if that's why we go home and we feel ourselves like ever, ev more and more going, this is weird. I just don't fit in. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. long here. Yeah. And it's not like a, a disliking of. Yeah. It's just if I go home to like, and you we know. all had the same upbringing. Yeah. Like, we all grew up in the same area, but we're different. Different, man. Like, some family on my dad's side, like, they live more in sort of rural country parts of the UK. And and I see them the, the fewest, the least amount of times because I just don't go to the countryside mm. when I go home. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> if you can imagine. Um, and they're so sweet and lovely. And I just sometimes I feel like when I go see them, I'm like, am I just a lot for them? You know, <laughs> am I just too fucking much? Yeah. And then I just go, I need to go home. I need to go back to San Francisco where I'm like barely enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know I, mean? I know. Like, <laughs> it's like culture shock both ways. Or yeah. culture shock. I, I don't share. I'm close. I'm, I guess I'm close with my mom. We love each other, but I don't, I don't really, sh I've never really shared much of my experience with her. But this past trip going home, I told her how for me, growing up queer and in the closet it was like a, a gift because i felt like it pull, it was like it pulled me out of the matrix mm. is like who i was was automatically directly in conflict with what people were teaching me and telling me yeah. so i i feel lucky that it, i was forced to question yeah. and then it got me to question everything else and then it got me to think independently and then i was able to actually like forge my own life right versus going okay i think i found this this will do yeah, you know, and my mom is experiencing, we're actually bonding over this because my mom is experiencing that now. Oh, Everything that's happening okay. politically has pulled her out of the matrix. Oh, and now wow. she's questioning things. And it's right. actually really beautiful to see this happening. She's awakening right now and I think she's in her 60s. I love that. Yeah. I, just, I really have always believed, again, the Madonna thing, it's never too late to evolve and change and like change your style. My mom has always been someone that she is a designer. She makes... Mm. Right now, she's a milliner. She makes hats. Mm. And and that's the longest thing that she's done. But she has tried loads of different styles. Jewelry, um, accessories, clothes. Accessories. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to move it down a little bit? Sure. Okay. 
Have I been not talking well? I just time? noticed it now, okay, so I don't know. But the whole thing isn't. Yeah, up. no, I think it'll be fine. Um, I think you're just getting cozy. Okay, yeah, I'm sinking into the chair. Um, so she's just someone that has never been like, this is what I do, and this is who I am, and this I'm always going to be that way. Perfect. Um, so I think it's made me, yeah, be like, you don't. This is great now. It doesn't mean you have to do this forever. You can ebb and flow and change. I love that your mom's going through it. Me too. Oh, not a renaissance, but like a, a shift. An awakening yeah. later in life. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah. Okay, Adobe family, this is Life for Them's podcast. I'm in the studio with Lady Camden, who was on season 14 of RuPaul's Drag Race. And we're featuring her single, Dirtiest Secrets, which we're going to get into right after the break. We're going to get into the music. We're going to yeah. get into the song. I mean, I'm loving all this anyway. We don't have to get into it. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I want to highlight it. I have okay, a little yeah. surprise for you. Okay. In the second half, another one. Yay. Like um, what else? Oh, and I also want to point out that anybody who joined the conversation partly through, you can watch the full video version of this right now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, online. So they can watch the video and you can actually be in the room and see Lady Camden's fun. You look, your hair is so tall. It barely fits in the camera. You're glittery. You've got your feathers. I wanted to just keep it casual today, you know. Little PJs. Very much like podcast vibes, you know, not, not too much razzle-dazzle, not yeah. today. Okay, we'll be right back here on Adobe Radio. Lady. Night. Put the headphone up. You're going to want to listen to this because oh. we have a little surprise for you. Oh, my God. Okay. I'm excited now. So we have a segment on the show called The People's Perspective. Uh-huh. What it is, is I drive rideshare. It's totally random. I drive rideshare, I turn on the rideshare app, and I just randomly start picking people up in LA, and I ask them questions based on who my guest is that week. Okay. And then I bring in the footage here, and I, sh I show you on air. Okay. So I did it this week. Great. I drove rideshare, yeah. and I interviewed a passenger, uh -huh. and I asked them questions about you. Okay. And this is what You we... asked them questions about me? Yeah, I told them you were going to be on the show. And did they know who I was? Let's just okay. Yeah. You can't tell me I'm gonna anything. show it to you. Okay. Yeah. This is what this is what happened. It'll be right oh, up there on the, on the screen. It'll okay. be a video. Yeah. Okay. The way I want, the way we want to do this is, I'm gonna play you a little bit of the guest song that we're featuring, and I just want to get your initial reactions to it, and then I can tell you about the guest. What are your initial thoughts? Oh, when the song first came on, initially thought it was like Persian. Good beat. So the song's called Dirtiest Secrets. Okay. The guest, it's a drag queen. Have you seen RuPaul's Drag Race? Yeah. Uh, the guest is Lady Camden. Oh, fun. See, I told you, you'd be glad you did this. I was listening to the lyrics of the song. I'm gonna wanna talk to Lady Camden about it. It's called Dirtiest Secrets. And from what I get from the song, it's it's a sexual song. It is about being intimate with somebody because she says in it, your dirtiest secrets are safe with me. There is a bit of sexual exploration in there, but it's also, a, for me, it's about like being trusting the person where it's like i can actually yeah. like tell you what turns me on or i can tell you like my kinks or yeah. or i can share things with you that i haven't shared with somebody else how would you interpret it i think another way you could interpret it is uh, oh, i'll just come out and fucking say it you're cheating with somebody oh so oh. like you're my greatest little secrets because they know all about it and you know all about them have you wow. been cheated on or <laughs> done the cheating my boyfriend and i actually met when I was about ready to be out of a relationship and eventually filed for divorce. So he oh, wow. was, okay, so you, wow, he wow. monkey branched with you? Yeah, and I monkey branched with him. Is this your current boyfriend? Yes. Well, okay, it worked out then. <laughs> no, I mean, I think so. And how long have you two been together now? Uh, we've only been together a year, but Same. I ended a 10 year, and then he ended a 20 year. So 10 years and 20 years, and now that's actually, oh, that's kind of romantic. So you and your Is current boyfriend no, started out as know. each other's dirtiest secrets because you were cheating on your exes. Do you share secrets with each other? Do you feel like you can tell each other anything? Oh yeah. Yeah, actually that's that, that's that's why it's just it's been for me it's been very weird because I've never had that honesty with anybody. Oh, I love that. This was fun. Uh, and I'm really excited that Lady Camden's your guest. Yeah. yeah. Thank you really so excited. Oh, that's so cute. I love that. Isn't that cute? The drama, though. Yeah, I wasn't oh expecting God. that. Yeah, I was like, come on, reality TV. That's what I love about this segment is I never know who I'm going to get or yeah. what they're going to say. Oh, my God. I did not expect that. Yeah. But also kind of weirdly exciting. Talk, talk Sorry. Also kind of weirdly exciting that... Um, 
I don't know, like he's going through some shift now. He's like been with someone for so long and then it, he's like, I've never been able to just be honest with someone in the relationship and tell them everything. I'm like, yeah, girl, you should be with someone that you can say anything to, yeah. I think. Yeah. But then some people want to be kind of, I don't know, you know, be in a relationship with that. They're like their perfect self. Yeah, they ended a 10 year and a 20 year to be That's crazy together. boots. I think it is kind of romantic. It is. Crazy Spice. Yeah. Is so, there more? No, that's it. I'm, that, okay. I'm going to hop back over here. Okay, I was wondering why. I was, I was like, yeah. I, hello? <laughs> um, oh my God, I love that. That's so cute. I love that he knew I was. Because that's the thing with Drag Race. It's very specific. It's not like, you know, everyone knows who I am. Like I walk down the street and no one knows who the hell I am. And then I'll get one person that will cry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's so like, funny. But it's just not, and then everyone else is like, "Are they famous?" I don't know why they're taking photos. That's them, you know. it's like you never know too what if you're incognito or if you're being. I mean, sure you sure you know when you're being watched. It's funny when I'm, someone's like, "Can I get a picture with you?" And I'm like, "Yeah, of course." And I'm taking a picture, and then someone who doesn't know who I am is like, I'm trying to figure out like, "Are they famous? Should I get a picture just in case?" Yeah, so I can look them up later. I don't know. You know, have you gotten used to? I just thought about when because I'm from Pittsburgh originally, mm -hmm. and. Um, I, I don't knew know enough about Pittsburgh to judge okay. anything about it. Really. The reason I bring it up I've is been, because I've never talked about this on air. I'm so fun to share to be able to share these stories. Um, I so I was there when um, um, Alaska Thunderfuck was there, and um, uh, you mean like when she was still living there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Sharon Needles, Sharon Needles yeah. yeah. And so I was a club promoter at the time at throwing parties, and I remember oh, so you like I probably met them. I had met them. Um, somebody brought in Sharon, and then Sharon brought in Alaska. I think they were dating. They yeah. per they performed at my event. Sharon stole my um, boas. I had these boas, <laughs> and she stole them. But um, I'll never forget because we grew up in the in the club scene in Pittsburgh. And then I moved, I think, to New York. And then Sharon was eventually on the show, won the show. And then my boyfriend and I at the time were at the airport in Pittsburgh, and we ran into Sharon. And this was right after Sharon won Drag Race. Mm -hmm. And Sharon like was like, oh hey boys, and and she's like, I'm famous now. Cute. And it was cute. I kind of cringed a little bit. Okay. Because she was like, I'm was famous. Like or if it was like no, a she's like, I'm famous now, and I I kind of cringed, but also I was like, I also kind of understand. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm curious, what was it like for you to be on the show and then post show? Well, it's interesting that I had that reaction, even that I was like, oh cute. And I can see it. I can see yeah. why it's cringe, but I think it's both for me. It's I, both. I understand. Like, it's like I think it's. I think the reason that I think it's cute and that it's, and also I'm just a, an Alaska fan. I love her so much. What are you talking about? Alaska? I'm talking about Sharon, Sharon. Needles, not well, Alaska. I, I don't know. Either, either I way, I think that like, um, it does change things a little bit when you know the personality behind it. But I think, yeah, yeah. the um, and it was how Sharon said it. Okay. I just got this yeah. vibe of like, uh. Well, I think what, my, what I was going to say is that, um, like, when you are a drag queen that gets on Drag Race and you're famous for it, of course there's luck involved in getting cast and, yeah. and your opportunities and stuff, but there's so much work that goes into getting to a place where you can even be considered to be on Drag Race that I think it's warranted to go, I did it, I'm yeah. famous now. You know, there's a little bit yeah. of, like, there is just so many shit gigs that you have to do. <laughs> and like, I know. And, and, and like awful experiences that to get to that place so but i i also do think it's a little cringe to be like to think that you know you're someone else because you're famous maybe the sentiment was was right and just he wasn't saying it in a way that i would have said it but who knows but it, it probably i i can imagine t uh, up until that point to be doing like as you had said shit gigs or struggling or just i mean there's no sh real shit i mean i'm just kidding like, yeah the gigs that i've done have all been yeah, yeah, yeah. To where I am, but you know, there are some gigs you look back on, and you're like, "Wow, I can't believe I did that." <laughs> but to have those experiences, and then and then to be seen and recognized, yeah, was probably exciting for Sharon because Sharon also was the first kind of like that. Um, not Sharon was like, I, how would you describe Sharon's style? You know, the spooky, the, first, the spooky, first ooky spooky, ooky spooky. Mm -hmm. So that was, I, I think, up until that point, maybe she never thought someone like her would be on the show She'd or never win. Seen it. That must have that must have felt good to be recognized yeah. and hundred percent yeah yeah I mean because you're like I'm the first one like, I'm unique and special you know? yeah I'm not the first British accent to be on Drag Race although I am in the US one 
I'm not the first ballet dancer to be on Drag Race either. So I'm just not fucking special at all, am I? Did you? I want to ask you, I have something in here. So I wrote down some of your quotes from previous interviews you've done. Oh, God. And you had said, a couple okay. things you said that I want to make sure I highlight is one was whenever ballet, one quote I have from you is you said, ballet was the first time I felt like I could stop being bullied and having to deal with mean kids in school. Mm -hmm. And the second quote I have from you is um, that you felt like ballet, with ballet, no one could get to you there. Mm -hmm. No one could tease you for being feminine or gay. And also, you never felt sexy until now. And like now that you become a drag, yeah, you said, I never felt sexy until now. I've never felt genuinely beautiful until I became a drag queen. And I don't really want to go back. I love ballet and I will still go to the ballet and love it. But I think what I need as a human was to sort of let go of that perfectionism because I felt so trapped in this shyness and the journey wow. of drag race really let me step out of that. I still stand by every word. Yeah. I do. I think, you know how we were talking about that, like evolving and changing and trying to find your real bit. I think that like ballet maybe gave me some, some sense of like, or oh, maybe I do have a slightly more heteronormative traditional classical life ahead of me maybe this is the way I can get it and I did picture and you know having a, a nice boyfriend and living in London mm. and being close to my family and them coming to my shows and maybe getting married and blah 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 and um, when I was kind of pushed away from that like I, I with injuries and with like my career just not really going the way I wanted it to in ballet. Like I didn't yeah. get into the Royal Ballet. That was my dream. I wanted to be Stephen McRae. I wanted to be, you know, a fierce principal dancer with the Royal Ballet. That's everyone's dream when they go to the Royal Ballet School. And when it doesn't happen, there's so much that's got you to that point that's really hard to accept that yeah. it's not you, that it's not going away. And so I think for me to get pushed... You can come closer to the mic. Sorry, for me to get pushed into something else was like again like you said it kind of forced you to question everything a bit yeah. and and getting into drag and seeing like success in a way that was not easier but came a lot more naturally to me than than success in ballet did yeah um it makes you go well maybe you are like fucking gorgeous yeah. <laughs> maybe you yeah, are fabulous you are. and maybe you need to just accept this in yourself yeah. and not try to be in their world in the ballet in the royal ballet not try to be in that world where you're not really being invited yeah you're sort of like really trying to get into that club and they don't want you and this is the club that's like babe we've been waiting for you bitch and like yeah. it, i think that's a little bit of what that is like the accepting that i am beautiful and that i am yeah sexy and that i am a sexual person or that i'm funny or whatever all these things like i think i knew but I didn't accept or really believe yeah. until I'm getting asked to do it and be paid to do it. Yeah. And by do it, I mean be me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I be my inner child. It's like wild. Like it's, I'm still, you know, I think that a lot of drag queens and other people that have been doing it a really long time get confused and question my lack of self-confidence on the show or like in person sometimes or hesita hesitancy. Rue had such a hard time. RuPaul had such a hard time with me second guessing myself and not really like trusting or like going for it or holding back sometimes. And it's that is I still feel like I'm newly not newly, but I'm still stepping into this like this is actually where I should be in this in this yeah. not just drag. I mean in this life of accepting every part of who I am. It takes, I think it takes time and I think it's a switch. Yeah. The yeah. aspect of, of accepting yourself is beautiful now. Um, I wonder, you know how they say some people when they're kind of like the fat kid and then even when they lose all the weight and then they're beautiful, they still feel like the fat kid inside or it takes time for them to let go. And they're did sensitive it take, about Did topics. it take you time to, like, did you feel like that kind of younger part of you was inside of you and took time to let it go or? or I'm still there. You're still there? You know, I think... I have to actively tell myself sometimes yeah, to walk into a room and assume that everyone loves you mm. until proven otherwise. And when I actively do that, like even when I just go to a fucking gay bar, you know, it's intimidating sometimes being around other queers. It's like everyone's judgy, you know? Mm. And I have to actively tell myself like, just, just relax and 
assume and I, you know I know I'm not alone here I know I sound crazy but I know I'm not alone I know that everyone has crazy self-sabotaging self-talk yeah and um some of us choose to talk about it some of us don't I know that we all sometimes have it in different environments and I think that I have to tell myself like assume that everyone just thinks you're great and the first time I did this was out of necessity because we were on tour work the world and we were in Canada and in Canada it's all stadiums there's like six seven thousand people in the audience sometimes maybe sometimes less but stadium right and I've never been confident on the microphone because I was always the dancer when I was yeah. back in my hometown before Drag Race. And now you get on TV and everyone expects you to be Bianca Del Rio, hilarious on the microphone, full of charismatic personality all the time. <laughs> and everybody wants to be that. Um, but in my mind, I'm telling myself, I'm just a dancer. I don't, I don't have jokes. I'm not funny or I'm not whatever. People don't want to listen to me talk. And then um, a drag queen that normally goes out into the audience, Rosé, she goes out to the audience and she picks people to come on stage and she's telling jokes. She's hilarious and she's doing it forever. It, not it forever, but like that's her comfort zone is talking on the microphone, being hilarious. And um, she had to go do another gig or something. So there was no one else to do it available because of quick changes and timing. They said, Camden, you're going to go out there and, and, and talk to the audience for a bit. Okay. And this was Asia O'Hara. <laughs> She's one of my favorite drag queens ever. She's phenomenal. She's very, very good at what she does. And she was like, yeah, you can do it, right? And I was like, yeah. And then I made like a little face and she was like, Camden, can you do it? And I was like, yes, 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 I can do it. And she's like, what's wrong? And I was like, I'm just nervous because I'm not that girl. And she was like, what are you talking about? You're great. Just go out there and do it. Worst case, worst case scenario, talk to one person in front of you. Don't look at the thousands of people. Just talk to one person in front that. of you. Have a conversation with them and see what happens. And I also went out there and I just said, imagine that this is your concert. They are all here for you. And they're all fans of yours. And I know most of them are probably, I hope. <laughs> but, you know, some of them have literally have never seen my season. Don't know who the fuck I am or they've been brought by their wife or whatever. Um, or we're Team Bosco or Team Willow or whatever. Mm. And... um. But I just told myself, just imagine that everyone there is like, l is obsessed with you. So I went out there and I just was like, oh, they're obsessed with me. Yeah. And it was easy. And I talked to one person in front of me. I made jokes the whole time. And it was so fun. And my perception of like how I am on the microphone vanished in that moment. I was like, oh, no, I'm fine, girl. I'm good. I'm oh, hilarious. <laughs> Do you know oh, what I mean? I was yeah. like taking people's drinks. I was like making jokes and I just had so much fun. And it just, it was a switch of the mentality of tell yourself that everyone loves you and then let them prove you wrong. Sure. But you can take it, you know, like if, if someone m makes it clear that they don't love you, then you just know to keep on walking away mm. or, you know, investigate. But like, I've lived so long in this ballet dancer. I'm not good enough. I need to be perfect or I need to be more straight looking or I need to be more this world that when you get to your 30s you stop giving so much of a crap about all of that and it gets exhausting yeah and it gets exhausting to not allow yourself to experience love that could be coming your way god i'm just going off on one long no, ass i TED love talk. this I'm sorry. i love this <laughs> but I, I think i've just been going through a lot in the last year or so okay not just off drugs but like touring family reading this book really studying your behavior, your triggers, your, how you are in a relationship. You know, I've been really focusing on it and working on it the last year or so. Okay. So that's why I'm, I have a lot to say about it. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> glad. I can see why yeah. they cast you on the show because you're easy to talk to. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't. I think I'm easier now, now? To talk to than I used to be. I was definitely a little bit more scaredy cat back then. I want to ask you about the fans because I... I had that quote earlier from you about how ballet was kind of a place where you could avoid, where you you stop the bullying. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, like how have the how have the drag race fans treated you? Because there there's a little bit of a reputation that some of them can be bullies as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I've been knock on wood. Oh, where's my wood? <laughs> um, I've been insanely lucky okay. with my experience. I know a lot of it is due to you and how you present yourself and who you are. And I'm lucky that I got the world to see who I am and they got to watch me struggle with something mm. um, genuinely. And I think that's why people like me because I think they just saw someone struggling with self-confidence and then like ultimately kind of coming out on top. 
And I think that's just a fun journey to watch in anyone. I think it's fun to watch someone like go from like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, mm. to like, no, I'm a rock star, you know? And I think that that, I didn't realize it until I left and saw it edited and produced and watched it back. I came, I came away asking so many questions. Oh my God, how's it going to go? But are they going to like me? I don't know if they're going to like me. I'm boring. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not funny. I'm not whatever. And when you watch it back and it's like, oh, okay. You just need to literally do nothing except be yourself. And I think that's why I was lucky in the fans that if they don't, if they don't love me, they don't hate me. They're just sort of like, oh, okay, whatever. You know, it's either that I just have been lucky with like not getting bullied yeah. by the fans. And I say that because I know that's not the case for everybody. Yeah. And I know that my sisters and my season even got so much nasty shit from people and people really do feel like it's fun for them to to be mean to you because you're not a real person or you're not going to they don't they don't get reprimanded or they don't feel what they've done to you because you're not in front of them. So they s leave a nasty comment. They say, "You fat bitch, you ugly." something racist something whatever yeah what is that why are they why are they like that with some abuse, and not with girl, others abuse is their it? own abuse that they are dealing with somewhere else mm. they get abuse in some other way mm. that they feel think of someone that you know that is so good and happy with who they are would they ever do something like that no 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 no, no, no. they wouldn't and it's you know you were told this as a kid bullies bully people sorry Bullies are bullied people. Yeah, yeah. But you don't believe it. You're like, yeah, you're just saying that to make me feel better. But then as an adult, you start to see shit like this, especially teenagers doing it. Yeah. And you go, oh, bless you. Bless your heart that you are in a place in your life where you feel the need to hurt someone because it's going to either make you feel better or you think I deserve it because you think that people deserve it because of what you've been given. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I would only be, I, I would only feel like you deserve a nasty comment because I'm getting them. So you should too, you know. And that's the way the world is, mm -hmm. in, in, according to my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And it's sad, you know. Well, I'm I'm glad that you your experience was positive with the fans. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong. I've been bullied elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I think it's exhausting and it's tiring and it's really really hard to see it. Still, you know, on a show that celebrates every kind of person or tries to celebrate every kind of person that people want to come and like knock us down you know I think it's hard for people to see people being successful when you don't feel good in yourself you know it's kind of like what we said earlier if their success is a mirror of your yeah. non-success like you want to tear down my sisters because they're doing well they did well on an episode and you don't like them it's like you don't believe they deserve it because you feel hard done by in some way you, you don't feel like it's fair that mm. they are thriving. You don't live in a world where you believe that everyone should just experience those things. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. you don't. You don't live in a world where you think that everyone should 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 be happy. Yeah. Like like think about that for a second. Like that's wild. Yeah. You think that some people should be happy and some people shouldn't. Yeah. Like there's a hierarchy of happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to ask you about dirtiest secrets. Yes. Yes. We. I want to get into this song. So yes. this is your new so single, fun. Dirtiest Secrets. <laughs> yeah. We're featuring. We're playing clips throughout of this. Thank you. Let's talk about it. Um, yeah. I have the lyrics here. I like to go over lyrics with guests. Yeah. The writing was really f the funnest part, I think. Was it? What mm -hmm. inspired... Okay, well, we, we talked about the people's... Pers I showed you the people's perspective. I had my take on it, and the writer had his take. What was the oh, original just... concept? Oh, because you spoke to Daniel, right? I haven't the spoken writer. to Daniel. No, no, no. I mean um, the writer for the... Oh, the writer in the car. The ride yeah, share. that was funny. It was a cheating. Yes. I was like, oh, that's why, because cheating is a big thing in his world. Not cheating, but like... And isn't it funny how someone's... It's interesting to me, like their personal experience, of course, everyone finds ways to relate to songs. Mm -hmm. And of course, he related to because of his own personal experience. Exactly, yeah. But what was the original uh, intent yeah. behind it? Um, I think it evolved from one thing to another. Like, it, um, you know, I wanted to do something this year. My goal was like, I just want a project that is not related to Drag Race necessarily or touring. It's more like really just me standalone moment. And I had such a fun time with writing my first song, Surrender. But you know, when you do one song, you're like, okay, I got my feet wet a little bit. Let's, let's like, I, I feel a bit more brave. Let's go in a bit yeah. more, a harder, more specific, more me. Just give it more gusto, you know, really go for it. And um, so I was like, I want to 
do a song mostly because I love music videos I come from an age where all I wanted to do is watch music videos mm. um, I feel like I came from the music video era you know 90s 2000s yeah MTV and- yeah MTV um, although people would venture to disagree 80s 70s like all that anyway um, I came from an era where I loved all that kind of stuff and so I wanted to do a music video this year and um, my friend Luke had introduced me to Daniel Bayo, who is a really talented um very up and coming, I think, uh, writer, producer. He's also a vocal coach. And, yeah. you know, he has, and it comes from kind of a classical background as well. Um, just a really interesting character. And then his friend Mallory. So talented. So talented. And his friend Mallory is this like tiny little girl. No girl, she's a woman, but she looks like a little girl and is such a little ball of fire. Like she will just sit there and we'll be saying lyrics and we'll be doing chords or writing and she'll just sing things and like blah, 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 mm. blah. She'll just keep spitting out ideas. She's very much like not precious about, you know, ideas. She'll just keep them coming out and and she'll just come up with something so iconic and then I'll, it'll come back to me and I'll go, I think it's less about this and it's more about that. Like my strength in the writing room was like, what is this always about? Like bringing it back to like the, which, I'll, which is, is going to address your question in a minute. And then Daniel would be composing you know, there can be tangents everywhere. Daniel would be composing and doing chords and, and thinking about the musical s- structure of it. And Mallory would be like finding a way to say what I'm saying in a poetic, danced, musical way. And then I would keep being like, well, that suggests this, but I think it's more this. And so Surrender, I was basically like, sorry, not Surrender, um, Dirty Secrets is basically about a hookup that I regularly had in San Francisco, which might sound like it's not really about anything super personal, but it was at a time in my life where I was starting to go, okay, maybe I should just give in to what it is that I like, what I feel good in and what makes Mm. me feel sexy and not try to be more masculine or more this, more that for someone that I think I want to get with. You know what I mean? Like I want to be with like the other pretty muscly gay boys and maybe I'll go to the gym and I'll try to be more masculine. Mm. I'll try to just not be too gay or not too whatever. And then I started to enter an era where I met this like one guy who would, we would have regular hookups with and he loved how feminine I was. And he would like, we would meet at this club and he wasn't really fully out, I don't think at the time. And he would, he would come to this club and pretend that we didn't know each other. And then he would like send me a text and like be like, okay, I'll meet you back at your place. And then he would like request that I, this might be a bit oversharing, but, um, he would request that like, I would wear certain things. He'd be like, oh, dress in something femme or wear like a skirt or wear like, you know, lace or, um, and they'd be like, okay, what color do you want? Like white or red or blue or pink, whatever. And he would tell me, so give me this little like list of things that he wanted me to, to wear. Yeah. And it was wild to me at the time. I'd never done anything like that. I was like, oh my God, I'm so, it's not that wild in the grand scheme of things, but it just made me kind of go, oh, I, it's fun. I feel really sexy. I feel really attractive. And it's just a hookup. It's not like we're, you know, I don't know his last name. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just, um, but it just was a really empowering moment of like, I'm hot and I don't need to do this other thing for these guys. I can just be myself mm. in bed and, and, and experiment and play and dress up. And it felt like a dirty secret to both of us, but like, it's not that dirty. And it's, it's really just hot you know and you deserve to fucking be hot and have good sex and like feel hot because you are hot it's like we all are in in our ways and like um it just felt really like if you're gonna write a song about something and you're not someone that has a team of people writing songs for you you know do about what you know right and like surrender was about it was more of an opportunity for me to to create an opportunity to do a swan lake moment Mm. for halloween you know Mm. i really just wanted to do like a black swan white swan contrast more of a storytelling it wasn't necessarily about me as much whereas this was like okay i know how to do something and and this comes from ballet as well i used to choreograph ballets a lot and that was my real passion behind dancing was like making ballets and any ballet that i did because i wanted to make a pretty piece to a pretty piece music was snooze fest and any in my opinion Mm. and any ballet that i made about heartbreak or feeling happy in a relationship or or something specific I remember the ballet. I remember what it sounded like. I remember steps from it. It resonated with me. Yeah. And it stuck with me. And I didn't care whether people liked it or not because I loved it. So I knew that if I do a song that's about something that I am really feeling behind and I really believe, I'm not going to care whether people like it or not. 
I'm just going to be proud of it. And I remember when this song was finally mixed, I was like, oh, I don't care if anybody likes this or not. I love it. You know, I love it too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's fine. It's, fine. it's a pop. You sent it to me on social media, and I listen. And I, I have to say, I've listened to. That's I haven't the heard laugh ever. By the way, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, <cut that> out. <laughs> I haven't heard every song that Rue Girls have released. Yeah, but the majority of the ones that I've heard, I, I'm not the uh, target audience of it. Yeah. Drag fans, drag fans, like they're kind of campy. The songs mm -hmm. are campy, and the, like I, I see the value in that, and I see, yeah. I see the, um, I see the appeal to the audience for sure. Yeah. Um, but for me, like I don't personally, I don't listen to that much pop music, and I, I don't listen to much, much campy music. Mm -hmm. um, but when I heard your song, I was like, oh, this is a really well done song. It's well written, well produced. Yeah. The bass line, as a DJ, I could play this in my sets. Yeah. So Thank I was, you. it was refreshing. I was like, oh, I want to have her on, and yay, yeah. I remember thinking I wanted the verses to sound, you know, naughty, sexy, a little Kim Petra y kind of. And then I really wanted the chorus to just feel like a Venga Boys, like Euro trash moment. I don't know. Like, or Euro pop, I should say. Um, it just speaks to my. The vocals are good too. Thing. Really nice vocals. Yeah. You have I've a nice been tone. On them. I've been yeah. taking singing lessons. I take singing lessons once a week from um, Empress, is her um, artist's name, mm. Shannon okay. um, Rugani. And she actually co-wrote and produced Surrender, my first song, and then she continued to be my vocal coach. And then Daniel was a vocal coach too. So he's got lots of tricks to get you yeah. in a relaxed state of mind to really be your best. And so it's it was it was definitely with help from both Daniel and Shannon that I feel more confident singing now. Yeah. You know? I'm not trying to come for like, you know, I'm aware of where I stand in the mm. music industry. I'm just new to all this and I'm like trying to have fun. But I do based off of how I felt with the success of this song like I and it's not a big and success. you debuted it at Folsom I did in San Francisco really fun. yeah how to hear that? your friends singing along is gaggy it's so crazy it's catchy yeah and um that feeling that I felt from it I know that being a musician being an artist like it takes a whole lifetime of experience to be really great at something mm. and I learned that with ballet and I learned that with acting and drag and everything so I'm not ever gonna like assume that I would be deserving of the same success as someone that's been in it their whole life. But this made me so happy to work on that I definitely want to do more of it. Yeah, this, please this do. It's fun. It's yeah. so fun to see something come together from an idea that or a text. That didn't exist. Yeah. 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 Okay, we're coming to the end of the show. Okay. We're going to close out with some questions. Great. So I had posted on social media that I was going to have you on and I asked people if they had questions oh, for yeah, you. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, so I have some of the questions that okay. fans asked you. Oh, so yay. let's end with that. Okay. Okay. These are some of the questions that came through. Okay, uh, the first one is, okay, this is from Carmen STRD. She wants to know, if if we're going to dress up as you for Halloween, what should we wear? Oh, the Freddie Mercury, obviously, is, like, I would say my most iconic moment. Yeah? Is the, is the Freddie Mercury yeah. reveal. The lightning bolts? Yeah, where I fell down, came up with mustache. Yeah. yeah, and if you can uh, create that as a gag throughout the night, more props to you. I would say that, or it might not be the most fun to make though. I think to, if you're going to make something, um, the teacup spring dress that I wore on Drag Race, because okay. it's very crafty. Okay. And, and it can go in many different directions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is, what was your favorite Drag Race challenge? Um, sure you've probably been asked that before. It changes. I, it changes. In my mind, I think there's two that were my favorite. One was the acting challenge where I've, first felt like I was like oh like nailing it and then um like that was the first time I was like oh oh I think I need to trust myself here a little bit so that was my one favorite my second favorite was the Moulin Rouge musical because it was just really a fun musical the music was great Leland produced I think all of it yeah and he's incredible and um they're incredible I don't yeah. I'm not assuming his pronouns but um he they um just gave us such a gem of a musical to to perform to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next question. What's your favorite juice in Don't Tell Me Roots 3? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, my God. Ah! <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Wait. I need it's to hear top, that one more time. Top, it's a top one. Oh, my God. <laughs> I used what? to work for fucking... <laughs> Um, I used to work for um, Pressed Juicery. That fucking asshole. I hate him. Ah, I'm going to 
kill him. Um, so during the pandemic, no drag shows. I don't need to probably go into this too much. But um, had no drag shows. Went back to working in a restaurant, which was my second mm. side gig when I was dancing because I didn't make a lot of money doing ballet. And then um, that wasn't enough during the pandemic to stay in San Francisco. So I was working at a restaurant and press juicery because the manager of press juicery is, was at the time um, Lonnie, also known as um, Mercedes Monroe, who is a very well-known drag queen in San Francisco. Mm. So she gave me a job at press juicery, saved my ass, and Evo was um, working with me. Oh, That is so funny. So which is your favorite juice if it's not Roots 3? Do you have one? <laughs> <laughs> Citrus two. Citrus two. Okay. Because I think I think as citrus two or three, I think it has coconut water in it. Okay. And it's more citrusy and it's cute. This is not a plug for press juice. We they have. <laughs> okay. Next question. Would you consider doing the Boulet Brothers Dragula? That's such a. I'm still not over that question. Um, I would not. <laughs> I would not. You can pay me enough goddamn money to <laughs> eat insects uh, or or pain or blood. No. Thank you. I'm, okay. I'm fine. I respect them a lot and I respect the show. I think it's entertaining and they deserve every success that they have. Me personally, I just feel like that's not going to do anything but make me unhappy to be in like a coffin with bugs <laughs> and like, yeah. I just can't. I'm not that girl. PTSD. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. This next one, it was the one I wanted to know too was, and I thought this was so sweet. She says, how are you actually doing? You know, because it can be a lot touring and being busy. Oh, that's very sweet. Um, it's I'm not gonna lie. Like I love. It's a weird thing because you don't want to complain about something you've always wanted, mm. and I don't want to end in a way. Like I don't want to stop being successful and like being busy and being booked. And like a lot of the girls would kill to be on the tour, and um, and or just busy in general. It's just hard when you are afraid to say no to things because you haven't had them all your life. Mm. So you're, I've never had money. I've never had an abundance of any of that. Or, and, and as a dancer or as a, anyone in the theater, you don't assume you're going to get things. You have to constantly audition for roles and constantly prove yourself. And so it's good and bad, right? It's good because it sets you up to not be lazy and to like want more for yourself at all times. But it, it, it's also hard to say no to stuff. And I'm... I'm learning to start to say no to things. Mm. And, um, but I'm definitely, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I think I'm doing great in work. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's really hard to date someone. And I know that that's like not the most important thing for me right now. Everyone's always like, get your money, work, work, work. You don't have time for a boyfriend, whatever. The manager of my home bar is a bit of a mama bear. He's very like, mm. don't get a boyfriend. You don't have time. You know, you've got to focus on your career right now, blah, blah, blah. And, but there's like a human part of you that just wants to be, you know, loved and like all yeah. that. That's what, what's hard for me is that I get lonely on tour a lot and um, you're in front of thousands of people and then you're alone. And then you're in front yeah. of thousands of people yeah. and then you're yeah, alone. Yeah, yeah. And it's great. I love it. There's people that I go on tour with that I, I'm obsessed with. I love some of the queens that I'm on tour with and the crew are amazing. Um, and I miss them when I'm not on tour with them. And there's a camaraderie that comes with that. But, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a wild experience. And I to go out to a gay bar and sometimes want to be no one and just be, and you get noticed when you don't want to be noticed. That's hard sometimes. But it's part of being famous is what you signed up for, you know, and I, and I love mm. it. It's just, you know, you don't get to switch it on and off. You, you are kind of here and this is who you are now, you know. And it's, it's, a wild, it's wild to be on stage, like DJing when I show up at the club and then you're isolated and then, you know, the club fills up with thousands of people, and like you said, but then everyone leaves, and then you leave on your own. Yeah. Or I'll be up yeah. there, and I'll have these out-of-body experiences where I'm like, these people are literally just standing there looking at me for hours. Yeah. You know, like I'm in a zoo, and I was, you know, I'm DJing, I'm playing music, I'm dancing, I'm, but they're filming, and they're, but it's just, it. but most people don't know what it's like to be on the other side of that camera, where people are just like watching you for... Right. I think it's and then like, you leave and you walk home to the hotel by yourself. I think it's harder when you're a DJ to then be like kind of focused on, I imagine, because you're not really signing up to be famous if you are just a lover of music and DJ. Like, mm. you're signing up to being famous and getting attention if you want to be a drag queen. You go on a reality TV show about drag. <laughs> I knew what I was signing up for. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong. I think it's just like um, the you underneath what you do is the thing that you I it's, it's hard to take care of. 
Yeah. You know, it's hard to take care of Rex. It's hard to take care of like the you outside of your work because everyone, I don't know. It's just, there's a lot of love uh, with an excitement with what we do and, mm. and, and it's addictive. I love it. I love being famous. I love, I love connecting with people. I love connecting with people too. I love too. that. I love but that. I think it's hard to like, you crave a connection with someone. I crave a connection with someone that makes me feel very seen, just alone with nothing you know and you don't have to talk about work you don't have to talk about work yeah. I, I wanna I want. I, I would love to have someone I don't know if this is like too vulnerable or whatever but I, I would just love to have someone that I could like share the boring things of my day with you know and it's, I have friends of course we all have like best friends you know it's different you know mm -hmm. it's just it's fun working on a relationship with someone and I think that's what you don't get when you are on the road all the time there's certain growth you can do by yourself but there's a certain growth you can only do in a relationship yeah. 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 Triggers come up. Yeah. You go, whoa, why did that piss me off? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. and, and then you investigate and it's interesting. Yeah. And then you forgive old parts of you, you forgive things that happened to you as a child, you forgive traumas or abuse or whatever, because you go through this thing of why is this a trigger? And why do, why does this make me jealous? And mm. oh, it's this child showing up and I have to forgive what happened and I move on. And mm. so it's very, it's a growth thing to be in a relationship with someone. I think I haven't been in that many relationships, which is why I'm like, I've got a lot of work to do still. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I heard something really beautiful recently. I can't remember who said it, but they had said about our parents and us, and they, and they said that we, well, our parents did the best they could with what they had. Yeah. But we are supposed to be, we're supposed to improve upon the design. Right. From the previous generation. Mm -hmm. And that really, I, I, that, I loved that. It's like they I like had that wording too. We're supposed to improve design. upon the design. Because the book that I read, he talked a lot about st like stopping the cycle of whatever the abuse was, you know, mm. in, um, and everyone's abuse is different. Some of it is like obvious and violent and physical and some abuse is not. It's verbal or it's, it's lack of things, lack of love um, or attention or whatever. And I think he talks about stopping the cycle, like so you are the one to break the chain because it's come from generations, generations, or it's developed over time. Mm. But I think improving on the design is maybe more of a approachable way. Stopping something completely is just like feels impossible. Yeah. But so I think improving upon the design is like nice. Love that. Yeah. I think there's maybe one or two questions left. Okay. Um, <laughs> how do you feel knowing all the lesbians love you? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh my god, lesbians are the best. Um. And I I, th like that's I, that's the last question. Yeah. Who, can I see who it is? Uh, sure. Is it? I knew it was Michaela. <laughs> Michaela <laughs> is like one of my favorite people that I've met since um, Drag Race. Actually, I have the most beautiful story. I have the most beautiful story about Michaela. I hope okay. it's okay that I share it. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm speaking on her behalf. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. I think it is. I mean, I'll say it in a way that's. Um, so they are someone that I've met at like DragCon. The first time I remember meeting lots of people and remembering someone specific was because Michaela proposed to me and proposed to me, I think maybe three times. Oh. Um, and it was just, it was a sweet tradition and um, they're Canadian and, and I see them at every Canadian show they go to. I think they travel to certain cities to come see me. And um, they gave me this sweatshirt that was an embroidered little, images of me and drag my different looks some from drag race some mm. from afterwards and then one in the middle that was me as rex like a little photograph of me and i was like i thought that was such a sweet sweet thing yeah and the center was like me like underneath all the stuff mm. and then i i got a note from her telling me that you know the reason that she was attached or drawn to me um is because they had a difficult relationship with their father and they weren't super close but when it came time for um the, the the father unfortunately passed away and then um Michaela was going through their stuff you know sorting things out when, when your parents passed away going through clothes and whatever and they found um a note with some money in it and said this is to go and see Camden because I know that you love her what and like Oh, it makes me get like emotional when I think about it because like they weren't close. Like I don't think he really accepted Michaela for who they were, and 
but that was their last sort of like thing was like I accept you and I know that this is important to you so I want you to have this money to go see her oh my god wow. <gasps> like I read that note and I just started bawling and so it that sweatshirt that I have like means more to me and like I think that like we get caught up in in meeting lots of people and it's really really nice and and like you know you, you do get a lot of sometimes trauma dumping on people like you get a lot of people being like mm. telling you something heavy that happened to them their mom passed away mm. or someone and blah 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 and it doesn't take away from their experience or anything but it can be a bit like you've got to protect yourself a little bit because if you get emotional every time you meet someone it's gonna you're gonna be gonna be taking on stuff wow. um so you do have to sort of be a bit strong but once in a while oof it'll get you and that one really got me and i was like oh my god you know and it's it became less about me and more about like someone's relationship improving or like or an, an effort to to reconnect because of something you, you were know like what i mean a vessel for that that was so fucking cool yeah. it really just made me really really happy in that oh moment. thank yeah. you for sharing that yeah it's nice that's a beautiful way, way to yeah. end <laughs> yeah we should end there yeah that's beautiful thank you for coming on life for them oh my god i had so much fun this was awesome i really enjoyed this you're a fabulous guest i wish i could always just get in drag and sit down and talk i'd be way better at that <laughs> <laughs> adobe family we have the full this went longer than the 53 minutes that normally airs on adobe radio so you can actually watch the full video version of the entire conversation my guest is lady camden from rupaul's drag race season 14 drag queen with the newest song out dirtiest secrets which we played clips of so you can go to spotify apple Podcasts, and youtube search life rhythms lady camden you can watch the episode mm -hmm. also uh, please connect with lady camden on social media TikTok, Instagram, everywhere. I'm there, baby. Yeah. I'm there. You know where to find me. Yay. Thank you for coming on Life Thank for Thumbs. So this is awesome. That's so much fun. We'll see you next time.